This time on Look, Look and Look Again, we wallow in a nostalgic ocean of terror, focusing on a oft-overlooked series. This show featured a cavalcade of grotesques on a weekly basis. Creatures of myth, of lore and of legend, stirring in the darkness until the time arrives for a fresh human victim. The police bury their heads in the sand, the government-elect does the same, the scientists shy away at fact taking second best to fable, and the people of America remain ignorant to the arcane powers stirring in their backyards. And 99% of the press are hesitant in giving these strange phenomenons a headline. But for one man, he is Kolchak. Kolchak is a story hunter, a reporter with the dexterity of sending out the most fantastic stories for his news business. The governments, as usual, do not want the public to know that demons, phantoms and Martians are residing and propagating in 1970s America. Therefore, Kolchak will struggle to save the Earth week after week without ever landing that tricky, colossal headline. But like the trooper he is, he just carries on trying. That's the basis of the 1974 film called Kolchak Night Stalker. program obviously inspiring the superb X-Files series in the 1990s, with even its producer Chris Carter saying that uh, Kolchak was a huge influence on the show. Kolchak surfaced from an unpublished 1970 paperback titled The Kolchak Papers and was penned by Jeff Rice. This led to a movie called The Night Stalker, which was a movie made for television. The Night Stalker centred around a vampire hunting his game in Las Vegas. It was immensely favoured by the viewers and press alike, which emanated in a follow-up called The Night Strangler, which is the macabre tale of an alchemist slaying women to make a youth serum in Seattle. It did very well in the ratings as well, and unlike TV movies of the era, which prefers syrup to sauce, this had a definite edge and never held back on the chills. NBC tried to cash in on Kolchak's victory by making the prosaic Norlis tapes in 1973, a visual anecdote about zombies and archaic spirits.
This TV movie starred Roy Thins, recognised to most for his appearance in the science fiction drama series The Invaders. Thins played the lead part as Norlis. It was directed by Dan Curtis, who had directed The Night Strangler, but despite similar camera work, was nowhere near as successful as Kolchak and lacked Kolchak's spirit. Persuaded there was money to be made in a weekly series, the ABC organisation in the United States put out 20 episodes of Kolchak the Night Stalker for its 1974-75 season of programmes. Darren McGavin headlined in both films and proceeded with the lead role in the series. McGavin was no foreigner to drama, with a slightly left-field edge, starring in a wealth of programmes for television, some of which had a more twisted slant. Programmes of this ilk, um, where he appeared, were The Hitchhiker, Tales from the Dark Side, Alfred Hitchcock Presents, and the miniseries The Martian Chronicles. McGavin also starred in Something Evil, a supernatural television movie directed by a then-budding Steven Spielberg. In the first episode of the series, we understand Kolchak has been driven out by the jurisdiction from Las Vegas and Seattle, and so Kolchak from now on would be set in and around Chicago. Kolchak plucks a few strings and ends up working for a news wire service called Independent News Services, or INS. It also gives Kolchak carte blanche to wield his INS pass to secure entry to assorted crime scenes and be first on the scene. The only other relationship to the film's series was Kolchak's employer and bicker partner, the corpulent Tony Vincenzo, played wonderfully by Simon Oakland, who runs the INS. Cue for some wonderfully witty showdowns between Kolchak and Vincenzo, some of which I thought would end up with Vincenzo having a coronary. Oh my, bootleg telephones just walked out that door. We've had a good thing going. Yeah, forget about telephones, Tony. That's not important. What is important is that it takes 420 pounds pressure, PSI, to crush a telephone. Now, it says right here that a medieval knight in full armor and in full weaponry weighs well over 400 pounds. Oh, I feel much better. All my life I wanted to know that a medieval knight could crush a telephone. Uh, well, I think three murders were caused by uh, medieval weapons. Uh, maybe by a guy in armor, I don't know. Anyway, I know a place where there's a, a whole slew of medieval armor and weaponry, and it's all run by a very angry man. So what? So what? Yes. Well. So Brewster Hawking, last night's victim, owns a soda pop conglomerate, and they recently acquired Heidecker Wine Importers and the Heidecker Museum. Carl, huh? I didn't understand anything you just said. Don't worry about it, Tony. You will as soon as I get through talking with Minerva Musso. Minerva Musso? The interior decorator? You? Yes. We're thinking of brightening up the office. You are going to be replaced by a Boston fern, and you a snapdragon. Why do I always feel like I don't belong here? The other frequenters of the series are the earnestly anxious Ron Updike, portrayed by Jack Greenwich, and genial old Miss Emily, played by Ruth McDevitt, and she seems to be the exclusive person Kolchak implies he trusts, although this practically brings his downfall and demise in the story Horror in the Heights. The outstanding formula of Kolchak's wry critique into his dependable dictaphone, the documentary atmosphere of news footage and only the limited peaks of the macabre are superbly conveyed to small screen. Kolchak Nightstalker teams with concepts and was ahead of its time in innumerable respects. Humour doubtlessly stands up strongly and for the period was noteworthy to feature in a series of this kind. Kolchak yields some scintillating one-liners, followed by many a droll occasion to grant that touch of comfort from the tautness of the storylines. 
And many of these are Kolchak's boss's belligerence of his dressed taste, which fits per- virtually iconic with the show and of the character. Kolchak always exhibits a blue and white striped suit, black tie, blue shirt and white sneakers, topped off by a bargain basement straw hat, which Tony Vincenzo refers to as a bird feeder. In one story, Kolchak testifies he will put on a change of clothes, but he is dedicated to his work too often to squander time on doing such a chore. McGavin here is superb in the lead role. He comes across as a reporter with the assassined charm, but manages to poke us at times so we realise he isn't invulnerable and just as scared when the veil between this realm and another is ripped right open. The camera styles of overcast imagery and the handheld filming technique give this programme a documentary earthiness which was another developing style and um, very unexpected, practically unheard of in the 1970s. The special effects are used uh, uh, very spartan, and this was to keep the aggregate low, and uh, the artistry itself works overtime. But on the summation, the results are remarkably well done. Such impressive scenes as a zombie lifting itself up in a camper van, the part of an edifice mutely exploding, and a passageway which convulses itself to fragments are very well pulled off. When Kolchak was repeated, and alas, like most shows that achieve popularity and end up for prime time consumption, Kolchak was censored for a targeted family crowd to reduce the horrific moments. Kolchak even commanded interest from the press due to its macabre undertone and, at times, genuinely blood-curdling moments. Bravo for the producers and the TV station realising that, contrary to popular belief, kids like being frightened too. Another interesting point to note are the guest stars that feature throughout the series, and uh, they're a fine fettle of performers from uh, favourites of the era, such as Richard Keel. Now he appears here without the metal molars, this time his gargantuan proportions cropped up in the episodes uh, Bad Medicine and The Spanish Moss Murders. The original Wonder Woman, Kathy Lee Crosby, she crops up as the uh, youth killer, playing Helen of Troy nonetheless, as well as actor Tom Skerritt in the episode The Devil's Platform. You would like, more than anything, to have the Pulitzer Prize. Though publicly you scorn the very concept of awards, you would like more than anything else to get to New York and work on a major daily paper. You would even like a suede back chair at your desk. Not leather, suede. Such small ambitions, really. Your editor is Anthony Vincenzo. He frustrates you terribly. You blame him for your problems, but you know that you yourself are responsible for most of them. Well, I... (laughs) Mr. Kolchak, all those stumbling blocks can be very easily put aside. You can have as little as you want, and much more, starting tonight. Do I... Do I have to sign my name in blood? Yes. He's known to us uh, science fiction fans for his role in the movie Alien, where he played Dallas. Skerritt is also known for appearing in another slice of horror hokum, this being 1975's The Devil's Reign. In the story of the century, McGavin appeared alongside Kathy Brown, his wife, who uh, in this particular episode plays the role of a policewoman. It really is a mystery to me why the show didn't catch on and more seasons were greenlit. However, it may have to do something with Kolchak being primarily a horror show and back then such a topic was either frowned upon and the subject matter thought too puerile or on the other side of the coin the subject matter was too taboo and put people off producing another season as the ratings of the programme and popularity proved trendy enough. 
The ratings were average, but the graveyard slot of 10pm for its transmissions didn't seem to help the show either. Kolchak is a synthesis of dread and whimsy, managed effectively, and the tales themselves are potent enough and often nicely expressed with an intensity of bleak, ethereal menace, which, done well, as demonstrated in the show, can put the willies up us all. You must remember, dear viewer, that the X-Files started here. And in the X-Files 2016 10th season episode called Mulder and Scully Meet the Were Monster, Kolchak was even parodied as a kind of affectionate homage, as well as this story uh, wallowing in the show's own history. And prior to that, McGavin played the recurring part of Arthur Dowes, a special agent with a mysterious past in the X-Files Season 5 episode, Travellers, and then again in the Season 6 story, Aguamala. Most fitting, I thought, a co-founder of the X-Files, by reputation, playing a co-founder of the X-Files in the show itself. Poorly syndicated in the UK at first, cut for running time and censorship, and out of sync in terms of the running order of episodes compared to how it was initially broadcast, Kolchak did not fare too well when it was brought to the UK audiences in the early 1990s. But then they were repeated again, and this time, and thankfully uncut second time around. Producer Dan Curtis, Richard Matheson and McGavin all hinted in about 1992 that they would favour a potential contemporary remake to mark the show's 20th anniversary, but then this just fizzled out. The 1990s wasn't a decade known for its significant horror and science fiction output. A resurgent happened in, in 2005 when a remake hit our screen, starring Stuart Townsend in the lead role. But alas, this, in comparison to the original, had diluted the vodka for water and is, on the whole, a shadow of its former self, with only six out of the ten episodes that were made being broadcast. But everyone's different, so you could always check it out and make up your own minds. The original series of Kolchak, The Night Stalker, is available on DVD, but a well-deserved rescan onto Blu-ray with a host of extras would be most welcome. Should you wish to purchase it, and I'm certain that some of you might, you'll no doubt find that those pennies are well spent for a binge watch and uh, what could be more appropriate for a dark crepuscular evening with the lights extinguished and the volume turned right up. Until our next time on Look, Look and Look Again, look under your beds. Cheerio. They tried to make a little park out of the woods near Snake Rock, daffodils, tulips, but they couldn't get anything to grow. There was an area shaped like a saucer at the bottom. If you want to see it, you'll have to hurry. Our park commission decided overnight to do extensive reclamation work in that particular spot. They're filling it in with concrete. What happened? It's all a point of view, really. A traveler has a breakdown, stops to fix it, gets a road map, has a bite to eat, and goes on his way. It's happened to all of us. This traveler happened to be light years off his course instead of miles. As for me, well, I haven't heard from the boys in the sedan yet.